Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for joining us here tonight. Uh, my name is Pete Eberly, and I'm with the Northern Chapter of the Colorado Renewable Energy Society. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with CRESS, uh, and our um, CRESS and our local chapters provide education, policy advocacy, and community engagement that accelerate Colorado towards a carbon neutral future powered by 100% renewable energy. Founded in 1996, CRESS is a statewide nonpartisan 501c3 not for profit. That is supported by our sustaining individual and business members, as well as donations. I would like to give special thanks to our Northern Colorado business partners that include Platte River Power Authority, Cooter Valley Rural Electric Association, Benchmark Electrical Solutions, Sandbox Solar, and Solaris Energy. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm gonna hand it over to our speaker for tonight, Dr. Omar Guerrera. Thank you very much, uh, Pete, for the introduction. And um, in this webinar, basically, I'm going to be presenting the results from a study that we did at NREL, or the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, uh, regarding the optimal deployment of energy storage technologies for the integration of wind and solar PV power sources. So first, let me talk a little bit about NREL. NREL is the National Renewable Energy Laboratory located in Golden, Colorado. And indeed, in this uh, picture over here, you can see uh, our main uh, campus in Golden, Colorado. Since we are a renewable energy laboratory, uh, you can see don't, you know, that we have uh, solar panels on the top of each of our uh, buildings. In addition to that, we are around 3,000 employees, including postdoctoral researchers, interns, visiting scholars, et cetera. Enrel has a, you know, a variety of uh, facilities in which uh, we develop and test renewable energy storage technologies, for example, uh, hydrogen electrolyzer, hydrogen uh, fuel cells, or solar PV panels or uh, solar uh, cells. Regarding our uh, funding, since Enrel is a national laboratory, most of our funding is coming from the U.S. Department of, Ener of Energy, or DOE. This is basically, you know, uh, federal uh, funding. However, Enrel also has a significant number of partnerships with industry, academia, and also like regional or local uh, governments, as well as international companies and international uh, government. Regarding today's uh, webinar, uh, I'm going to start with an introduction to the energy storage uh, problem. Then I will be talking a little bit about the modeling of energy storage uh, uh, deployment. And here the idea really is to uh, demonstrate why this is a very complex uh, problem to be addressed. After that, I will introduce the case study as well as the associated assumptions uh, for, for the energy storage uh, deployment problems that we were addressing. And then after that, I will present the results associated with that case study. But here, really, the focus is to show how energy storage technologies can help us to achieve 100% renewable power grid. So basically, the idea here is to show a potential path towards 100% renewable um, electricity supply. Uh, finally, I'm going to summarize this webinar with uh, some key conclusions from this uh, study or from this uh, work that we did at NREL. Now, regarding the energy storage problem, here on the left, you can see the representation of um, the net load for a KISO power system with 95% carbon-free energy mix, including 28% wind plus uh, almost 52% solar PV uh, power generation in the electricity mix. Net load, by definition, is electricity demand minus variable renewable energy, or VRE, or you know, wind plus solar PV power availability. So if we take a look at plot A, you can see the hourly fluctuation of the net load for a given uh, year. And again, you know, for that specific power system with 95% carbon-free energy mix. And if you take a close look at this plot, you can see some hours in which uh, we have a positive net load. So that means that the electricity demand is greater than the availability of wind and solar uh, PV power sources. So in this case, you need additional generation from conventional power sources, for example, 
a hydropower plant or a natural gas combined cycle power plant or a coal power plant. On the other hand, you can also see some hours in which we have a negative uh, net load. And that means that the availability of wind and solar PV is greater than the demand. So we have BRE uh, surplus or wind plus solar PV surplus during those uh, hours. Now, if we uh, take a close look at the given day in that specific year for that specific power system, now we can move to plot B in which you can see the hourly fluctuation of the net load for a given day in that specific year. So in plot B, you can see that there are some hours in which uh, we have a significant BRE uh, surplus, and this BRE surplus is mostly driven by the deployment of uh, solar PV power sources. So in this case, we may use short duration energy storage technologies, for example, a lithium ion battery, to do the intraday shifting of PRE surplus. Basically, you know, shifting um, PRE surplus across different hours in the same uh, day. Now, if we assume that we have enough short duration energy storage capacity for the intraday shifting of PRE surplus, now we can move to plot C in which you can see the um, daily fluctuation of the total uh, net load for a specific week in that specific year. And here you can see that in day number two, we have a significant BRE uh, surplus. So in this case, long duration energy storage technologies, for example, compressed air energy storage or pump hydro energy storage uh, could be used to do the interday shifting of BRE surplus. Basically, you know, shifting BRE surplus across different uh, days in the same uh, week. Now, if we assume that we have enough short duration and long duration energy storage technologies for the intraday and interday shifting of PRE surplus, now we can move to plot D, in which you can see the monthly fluctuation of the total net load uh, for that specific uh, year. And here you can see that we have a significant PRE surplus during spring and summer, and this BRE surplus is mostly driven by the deployment of solar PV power generation capacity. So in this case, we may use um, seasonal energy storage technologies, for example, hydrogen energy storage, to do the seasonal shifting of BRE surplus. So basically shifting BRE surplus across different uh, months in the same year. So in summary, if we want to achieve higher penetrations of wind and solar PV power uh, sources, in the electricity grid, we may need a combination of short duration, long duration, and seasonal energy storage technology. Uh, quick information here, uh, global install and operational storage power capacity is around 174 gigawatts, but almost 93% of that storage uh, capacity is associated with short duration energy storage capacity. So in the future, we may need more deployment of uh, long duration and seasonal energy storage technologies if we want to achieve higher penetrations of wind and solar PV power sources in the electricity grid. Now let me talk a little bit more about the, the services that energy storage technologies can provide to the system. So in this diagram, you can see a representation of the different services on the left that energy storage technologies can provide to the system. And then in the horizontal axis, you can see the time scale associated with each uh, service. For example, uh, firm capacity services uh, has a time scale from minute to maybe one year. And on the other hand, frequency reserve has a time scale from milliseconds to one hour. So you can see a really a variety of services that energy storage can provide to the system plus a variety of time scales associated with each of those uh, services. Now, regarding deployment, regarding the deployment of energy storage technologies, uh, here in this table, you can see a potential uh, path for the deployment of energy storage uh, technologies. First, we have, you know, um, historical, let's say, uh, deployment of energy storage technology, and this is, you know, before uh, 2010. And here, storage technologies were deployed mostly for peaking capacity and energy time shifting, as well as operating reserve. In this case, the, the technology that was deployed was pump hydro energy storage. We had in the US around 23 gigawatts of deployment of pump hydro energy storage. And mostly the duration for this uh, um, storage capacity was between eight and 12 hours. 
Now we are in phase number one, and here in this phase, energy storage technologies are deployed mostly for operating desert, and the potential market for this uh, um, storage deployment phase is around 30 gigawatts of power capacity, and the duration is less than one hour. So in this phase is the phase in which we are today, and it's mostly you know the deployment or driven by the deployment of lithium-ion batteries for operating reserve frequency regulation, etc. Then we are going to move to phase number two, in which energy storage technologies are going to be deployed mostly for peaking capacity. Um, the potential market for this phase is between 30 and 100 um, gigawatt of storage power capacity. And this is going to also depend on the deployment of solar PV uh, power sources. The duration for this specific uh, phase is going to be between two or six, uh, between two and six uh, hours. Then we're going to move to phase uh, number three, in which storage technologies are going to be deployed mostly for diurnal capacity and energy time shifting. Um, the potential market for this phase is going to be more than uh, 100 um, gigawatt of power capacity. And on the other hand, the duration for this phase or for the technologies that are going, that are going to be deployed in this phase are going to be between four and 12 hours. And finally, we're going to have the multi-day or, or from multi-day to seasonal capacity and energy time uh, shifting application or, or phase. And in this phase, you know, the, the capacity uh, or the potential market for this phase is going to be up to 250 gigawatts, so significant, you know, potential capacity for this specific phase. And the duration for these technologies that are going to be needed for phase number four are going to be greater than 12 hours, because here we are trying to address mostly the long duration and seasonal energy storage uh, problem of wind and solar PV integration. Now, regarding the technologies, there is a variety of technologies that are either you know commercially available or under development. But what I would like to mention here is that um, the ideal energy, technolo energy storage technology doesn't exist. For example, for long duration and seasonal energy storage technologies, you may have a technology with a really high efficiency, let's say 80%, but this technology may not be deployed everywhere. And this is the specific case for palm hydro energy storage. On the other hand, you may have a technology with a relatively lower um, round trip efficiency, for example, a flow battery, and this technology can be deployed everywhere, but today this technology has a really high capital cost, for example, or limited demonstrations. So, you know, there is no an ideal energy storage technology that's gonna be more cost effective than every other technology, right? Like, you know, the optimal energy storage technology is going to depend on the specific case in the specific system, in the specific application. So we don't have the, let's say, ideal energy storage solution. So most likely our future is going to be more a combination of different energy storage technologies. And this is precisely what our study is going to uh, show in the next couple of slides. Just to mention here that I didn't include uh, lithium ion batteries but the same case applies for lithium ion batteries. They have a really high efficiency. They have a relatively low power uh, capex, but the energy component, the capex for the energy capacity of lithium ion batteries is really high. So that is the reason why lithium ion batteries are more cost effective for short uh, duration applications. Let's say one hour or two hours of duration. If you move to longer duration, let's say six hour, eight hours or 12 hours, then uh, pump hydro energy storage, compressed air energy storage, or hydrogen are going to be more cost effective because they have a relatively lower uh, energy related uh, capex. Now, at this point, we know that there is a variety of, of, of services that energy storage can provide to the system. There is a variety of technologies that can be used for each of those services. And now the question is um, do we have the tools to do? a comprehensive analysis of energy storage requirements and, and deployment for the penetration of wind or for the integration of wind and solar PV uh, power sources. So the idea with this slide is to show that today we don't have the capabilities to do a comprehensive modeling of energy storage uh, deployment. So for example, on the left, you can see the typical uh, power system modeling flow that we apply at Ender for the integration of wind and solar PV resources. In the first level, we have the building block. And here in this building block, the idea is to 
uh, as were the following questions. What do we build? Do we build um, lithium ion batteries? Do we build a additional solar PV facility or a wind facility? And also where and when? Do we build this facility, I don't know, in the you know, uh, north part of California or in the south, etc. In order to address this specific, uh, let's say, investment uh, decisions, we use a capacity planning model, for example, REITs or RPM. And in this type of models, we typically use a multi-year optimization window with time resolution of, let's say, time slice. So really um, uh, oversimplify time resolution because we want to optimize the system for longer uh, time horizon. So we need to reduce the resolution uh, or the temporal resolution of our model. Then we move to the operational level. And here at the operational level, the idea is to evaluate if that specific expansion plan is going to be feasible from the operational point of view. So in order to do that, we use the unit commitment and economic dispatch uh, models, for example, Plexus or, or SIP. And here we typically simulate the, uh, the electricity uh, market, basically, you know, one day ahead plus one day uh, look ahead uh, market or 48 hours uh, time horizon with hourly resolution. Why hourly resolution? Because at this stage or at this level, we want to evaluate the operation of the power system. So we need to take into consideration operational reserve, uh, ramping constraints, as well as, you know, hourly fluctuations of wind and solar PV generation. Uh, on the other hand, we also have the energy storage uh, modeling tools. And this could be, you know, copper plate or price taker models in which we typically run, you know, one year or multi-year optimization window with hourly resolution. But here we are not able to include the operational details of the power system or for example, the transmission constraints of the power system. So, on one hand, we have, you know, energy storage models that can simulate, you know, multi-year or multi-year optimization windows with hourly resolution. And that is precisely what we need to do a, you know, full year optimization of the energy storage devices, particularly for long duration seasonal energy storage applications. And on the other hand, right, we have the power system modeling tools, like, you know, a capacity planning model or a unit commitment uh, and economic dispatch model that has the operational details of the power system or, or the transmission constraints of the power system, but either they don't have the time resolution, for example, the capacity planning model doesn't have the hourly time resolution, or they don't have the a longer optimization window that allow us to optimize the operation operation of the long duration seasonal storage device. Right. So, in summary, the comprehensive modeling of long duration and seasonal energy storage technologies requires capacity planning and production cost models with one year or multi-year optimization windows and hourly resolution. And on top of that, we should keep chronological information because you know the operation of energy storage devices needs chronological information just to evaluate the operation of that storage device across different hours, days, and, and weeks. However, this represents a significant computational challenge. For example, Power system uh, modeling tools are good for modeling power system details, right? Transmission constraints, operational reserve, ramping capabilities, etc. But they don't have a um, either, you know, good time resolution capacity planning model. They don't have a good time resolution, or they don't have a long optimization window. Let's say one year optimization window. On the other hand, we have the um, storage modeling tools, which are really good for modeling the operation details, the operational details of long duration seasonal energy storage devices. But these uh, models are not able to capture, you know, operational details and transmission constraints of the power system. So today, I would say we don't have the tools to do a comprehensive modeling of energy storage technologies or multi-scale energy storage technologies. However, for this study, we developed a copper plate optimization models called SDOM or storage deployment optimization model. And in this model, the idea was to do the evaluation of the energy storage requirements in order to achieve a, uh, um, a given penetration of wind and solar PV power sources. So in this optimization model, we develop a mixed integer linear programming optimization of the energy storage deployment and wind and solar PV installation. So in this model, we have different input data, for example, VRE data. And here I am talking about, you know, wind plus solar PV hourly profiles, 
uh, we the solar PV capacity and, and cost for each installation for each location. We also have load and generation time series for conventional generators. Uh, we also include different energy storage technologies to be evaluated. And for each technology, storage technology, we also include, you know, capex for power capacity, capex for energy capacity, round trip efficiency, etc. In addition to that, since the idea here is to evaluate, you know, a given um, penetration target for wind and solar PV, we also include a balancing unit, in this case, a natural gas combined cycle power plant that is going to provide the remaining power that we need to achieve 100% um, electricity demand uh, supply, right? Imagine you have, let's say, a 90% uh, energy mix targets, right? So let's say you want 95% 90, of your energy mix to be carbon free. That means the, that the additional 5% is going to be provided by a conventional fossil generator, in this case, a natural gas combined cycle power, power plant. So that is, the, that is the reason why we use a balancing unit in this study. In addition to that, as I mentioned before, uh, we are going to be focusing on a given energy mix target. So we also need that carbon free or renewable energy mix target. By carbon free, I mean nuclear is included as part of the energy mix. If we impose a renewable energy mix target, that means that nuclear is removed from the uh, um, generation portfolio. Regarding how this model works, here you can see a representation of, of the, the idea behind this model. So on the left, you can see the time series for these conventional generators, like nuclear, large hydropower, other renewables. And in other renewables, we include the small hydropower, biomass, and geothermal power sources. Then we have the electricity demand, like hourly time series for electricity demand for that specific system. And in this case, imagine we want to achieve, let's say, 100% uh, um, carbon-free energy mix. So nuclear is going to be included in the in the in the energy mix, and then we need to fill this gap using, you know, solar PV, wind power sources, plus short duration, long duration, and seasonal energy storage technologies, and plus um, curtailment. So we need to optimize all of those options, right? Like two renewable power sources, solar PV plus uh, wind, three different energy storage technologies, short duration, long duration, and seasonal energy storage, plus operational curtailment to fill this gap and achieve you know, 100% uh, carbon-free energy mix. So this is how the model is going to work. Regarding the case study, we uh, focus mostly on the seven independent system operators in the US. And here, the idea was to evaluate um, how much energy storage do we need in order to achieve 100% renewable energy mix by 2050 in each of those uh, independent system operators? I would like to mention uh, something here, and is that you know uh, these seven uh, independent system operators like Kaiso, sorry, Kaiso, ERCOT, SPP, MISO, PEM, uh, New York ISO, and ISO New England. Those seven ISOs combined are projected to represent almost 65% of the total electricity, de electricity uh, demand in the US by 2050. And this is equivalent to a demand growth of almost 27% from 2019 to 2050. Regarding the uh, parameter for each of those uh, power systems or ISOs, here you can see a summary of the 2019 uh, peak load and total uh, demand for each of these uh, power systems, as well as the projected uh, peak load and total demand by 2050. In addition to that, here in this part of the table, you can see a summary of the time series of the conventional generators, let's say nuclear um, hydropower or large hydropower and other renewable uh, power sources. So, you know, seven. Uh, different uh, power systems are going to be evaluated, and then we're going to impose, you know, target, let's say, 85, 75, 90% carbon-free or renewable energy mix target, and then we're going to see how energy storage technologies are going to be deployed in order to achieve a given uh, penetration target of wind and solar PV power sources. Regarding energy storage uh, uh, technologies, here in this table, you can see the assumptions associated with these technologies, 
And what we did here was that we include generic technologies. So here we are not talking about lithium ion batteries or pump hydrogen storage. Those are more like generic uh, technologies for short sure duration. You can see here the power, I mean, the capex for power capacity, the capex for energy capacity, the round trip efficiency. And each of those assumptions were based on a specific technology. For example, for short sure duration energy storage, we make assumptions uh, associated with lithium ion batteries. Then we include two different long duration energy storage uh, technologies, LD1 and LD2. LD1 uh, was based on assumptions for compressed air energy storage. On the other hand, LD2 was based on assumptions for pump hydro energy storage. And the key difference here is that uh, long duration energy storage technology LD1 can decouple charging and discharging power capacity. So basically, the device that is used to charge the energy storage device is different than the, than the device that is used to generate power from the um, energy storage uh, device. So this means you know, more flexibility, basically. And then for seasonal storage, we make assumptions associated with the projections or technology, technological projections for um, hydrogen energy storage. And again, you know, this is a technology that can decouple power charging capacity and discharging uh, power capacity. So this means, you know, these two technologies are more flexible because they can use different devices for charging and discharging the, the, the energy that is stored in that system. Regarding assumptions for wind and solar PV and the gas combined cycle power plant, we use projections from the NREL 2020 annual technology baseline or ATB. And this information is available in this specific uh, link over here. Um, something that I would like to clarify here is that you know the, the power capex is as is basically the capital investment that is needed for this power device that is used to charge or discharge the energy storage uh, system. On the other hand, the energy capex or the capex or capital investment associated with the energy capacity is basically the the cap the the cost associated with the um, energy storage device or the volume that you're going to build. Right, so if you need to build a bigger, you know, tank, let's say, then you need to invest more energy uh, capex because your tank is bigger, right? So that is the difference, right? Like energy-related capex is associated with the storage capacity. On the other hand, the power-related capex is associated with the capac power capacity for the devices that are used to charge and discharge the storage uh, devices. Regarding the results, uh, here in this diagram, you can see the optimal wind and solar PV deployment for different energy mix targets or renewable energy mix targets in KISO and MISO. If you take a look at plot A, you can see that you know KISO is a system that's going to be dominated by the deployment of solar PV power sources. So this is not a surprise because solar PV power sources are very cost effective in California. So this is a system that is driven mostly by the deployment of solar PV. On the other hand, if we move to plot B, you can see that in MISO, the, the deployment of PRE is going to be driven mostly by wind power sources. And the reason for that is that you know wind power sources are very cost eff uh, effective in MISO. Something interesting here is to see that as you increase the energy mix target for wind and solar PV or for renewable energy mix from, let's say, 75 to 95, you can see an increase or monotonically increase in the optimal BRE curtailment, right? So, you know, curtailment is or could be an economic uh, option for the integration of wind and solar PV. But when we move from 95 to 100 percent um, renewable energy mix, you can see a significant drop in the optimal uh, curtailment. And the reason for that is that at this point, 100 percent renewable energy mix the deployment of seasonal energy storage is more, is more cost effective than over building wind and solar PV power generation capacity. So curtailment, you know, we don't need to reduce curtailment to zero. Curtailment could be an economic option for the integration of wind and solar. But at some point, seasonal storage could be more cost effective than, you know, over building wind and solar PV power capacity. So I think this is a, a key finding from this study. Now, regarding the deployment of energy storage technologies, here in this slide, you can see on the left, uh, plot A and C, the optimal power capacity that is deployed for each storage technology and for each uh, renewable energy mix target 
for Kaiso and MISO. On the top, you can see that for Kaiso seasonal storage uh, technology is not deployed till 95% renewable energy, energy mix target. And on the other hand, when we move to MISO, you can see that uh, the seasonal energy storage uh, technology is deployed for 90% renewable energy mix. In addition to that, you can see regardless of the power system, you can see a combination of different technologies. And this is in line with, with uh, what I was mentioning before, right? The ideal energy storage technology doesn't exist. And, this is, and because of, of that uh, fact, now you can see that you know, the optimal deployment of storage technologies involve different storage technologies across different time scales, because you know, they can provide different services across different time scales, and each technology is going to be different in cost, efficiency, um, 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 cost, efficiency, and also constraints for the deployment, right? So I think this is something interesting. There is not going to be a unique or ideal energy storage solution that is going to solve all of our energy storage problems. There is going to be a combination of technologies that are going to help us to integrate more wind and solar power sources into the electricity uh, mix. On the other hand, in plot B and D, you can see the storage duration or the optimal storage duration for each of those uh, technologies that are deployed. We can see, for example, that lithium ion batteries, uh, they have durations between, I would say, 1.4 hours to up to five hours. And then we move to more longer durations with, uh, you know, these two technologies, LD1 and LD2. And here, you know, the duration is between, I would say, 6.5 and up to 14. 0.5 hours, so really longer uh, storage durations. And then we have the seasonal uh, energy storage uh, technology that is deployed for really high penetrations of wind and solar PV power sources. For example, in uh, MISO, you may need, you know, just seasonal storage uh, technologies with up to 14 days of duration. And in KISO, you may have, you know, um, or you may need a seasonal storage uh, deployment with more than one month of duration. So very interesting, you know, different storage duration for different technologies and for different power systems. So there is not a unique solution. There is not a, an optimal, I would say, um, storage duration for a given system, right? There are going to be different technologies, and for each technology, there is going to be an optimal energy storage, uh, so, sorry, a storage uh, duration that is going to be needed to integrate more wind and solar uh, PV power sources. Now, regarding the operation of, of these uh, technologies, here in this diagram, you can see a summary of the state of charge. This is basically the level of the battery, and this is normalized by the maximum capacity. So if this metric, SOC, is one, that means that the storage device is full. And on the other hand, if the SOC metric is zero, that means that the storage device is empty. So if we take a close look at the operation of the short duration energy storage devices, in this case, you know, SD for KISO and MISO, you can see that this technology is used mostly for the intraday shifting of BRE surplus. And indeed, you know, this technology has between one and five hours of storage duration, right? So you can do just, you know, intraday shifting of BRE surplus. But then when we move to the long duration energy storage technologies, LD1 and LD2, now you can see a kind of combination between intraday shifting of BRE surplus and also interday shifting of BRE uh, surplus. So in this case, you can see that you know these uh, devices st start charging in the very early in the morning, and then they are full at you know kind of 3 p.m. or 4 p.m. and then they start to discharge at night when you don't have uh, solar power in the system, right? So this is basically intraday shifting of BRE surplus. But then you can also see some you know interday shifting of BRE surplus because in some cases you have longer duration for LD1 and LD2 uh, technologies. So for long duration energy storage technology, we saw a combination of intraday shifting of BRE surplus and also intraday shifting of BRE surplus. Now, if we move to the seasonal energy storage technology, in this case, uh, this technology SS over here, now we can see a fully seasonal dispatch of that technology. And the reason for that seasonal dispatch is that for, for, for the technology that we use, we use almost, I would say, 44% for round-trip efficiency, so very low round-trip efficiency. 
right? So you don't want to use this technology, you know, for intraday shifting of the Arisu Plus because you're going to lose significant amount of, um, of energy. So the seasonal storage technology is used mostly for seasonal uh, uh, shifting of the uh, surplus. Now, regarding the, the cycling and storage to storage uh, operation, here on the left, plot A, you can see a summary of the uh, number of annual cycles for each technology and for each uh, power system. And, you know, in general, we can say that the number of annual cycles for each technology is going to be it's going to depend on the round trip efficiency. If you have a technology that is more efficient, that means that you're going to be using that technology more frequently because you're going to lose less energy. So for short duration energy storage technology, you have a significant higher number of cycles. And then for seasonal storage technology, as I mentioned before, uh, we have a really low number of number of, sorry, number of annual cycles per, per year for that technology because this technology has a very low um, round trip efficiency. On the other hand, we also uh, saw some specific cases in which um, storage to storage operations were taking place. And, and here by storage to storage operation, I mean the following. There are some specific cases in which, let's say the short duration energy storage technology or device and the long duration energy storage device is full. And, and now you can use that um, energy storage to charge the seasonal storage device that has a huge energy storage capacity. So in that way, you can, you know, at night you can discharge your short duration and long duration energy storage devices into the seasonal energy storage device. And then in the next day, your short duration and long duration energy storage devices are going to be empty and ready to, to charge more wind and solar PV surplus the next uh, day. So this is uh, really interesting to see, you know, different storage devices operating in kind of integrated way to reduce the cost of the system. You know, from the energy efficiency point of view, that doesn't make sense, right? To use one storage device, you're going to lose some energy. To charge another storage device, because the, the you know the the total efficiency is going to be much lower, right? But from the cost point of view, that kind of makes sense. You don't want to overbuild short duration energy storage capacity to capture, you know, wind and solar PV surplus. Maybe what you want to do is to reduce the deployment of short duration and long, uh, and long duration energy storage. And then, you know, at night, you can, during the day, sorry, you can charge those devices, but at night, you can discharge those devices into the seasonal storage device. And the next day, those devices are going to be empty and ready to capture the additional solar PV surplus that is going to be uh, taking place in the next uh, day. So this is, from the optimization point of view, is a really a smart way to operate storage devices. So we, we need, you know, different technologies, different storage technologies in the system. And also, we need to be smart on, you know, about how we operate those systems. We want to maximize, you know, the, the benefit of the deployment of energy storage technologies in the system. And storage to storage operation is a way to reduce capital costs in order to integrate more wind and solar PV power sources in the power system. So this is a very, you know, interesting operational way to reduce capital costs for storage deployment. As a summary from this uh, presentation, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, we can achieve, let's say, up to 95% uh, um, wind and solar PV integration with curtailment. And in this case, you know, we saw that curtailment is increasing uh, monotonically with the share of wind and solar PV uh, uh, power sources. However, there is a, a, a point between around 95% where seasonal storage is more cost effective than uh, curtailment. So curtailment is uh, an economically feasible option for the integration of wind and solar. But at some point, you know, seasonal storage is going to be more cost effective. So still, you're going to have some curtailment, but you know, curtailment is going to be less than, let's say, for 100% that the curtailment that was optimal for 95%, because at 100%, you're going to have a significant deployment of seasonal energy storage uh, technologies. Uh, then we can say also that we can achieve carbon-free or renewable energy mix of up to 80% with, with just economic uh, curtailment and with a combination of short duration and long duration energy storage uh, technologies. So no need for seasonal energy storage uh, technologies if you are at 80 or below 80% uh, carbon-free or renewable energy mix. However, 
there is a point between 80 and 95 percent uh, carbon free or renewable oh, sorry or renewable um, energy mix where you know seasonal energy storage becomes cost uh, effective so in that case you know we saw a significant deployment of seasonal energy storage technologies on the other hand we found that the cycling behavior of energy storage technologies is driven mostly by the round trip energy efficiency with you know technology with higher round trip efficiency are going to have higher number of cycles uh, per year and finally we also found that a storage to storage uh, operation or one storage device charging another storage device and the decoupling of charging and discharging uh, uh, power capacity are cost effective options for the integration of high levels of wind and solar pv power so power sources into the electricity grid so with this uh, i would like to, to to say thank you for for being here and i guess i should be ready for taking some interesting questions from you guys Omar, thanks very much. Uh, it was a great presentation. And uh, I guess we'll just go ahead and jump into the questions here. Um, first one, um, can you talk a little bit about small pumped hydro? Um, and this is in reference to Greg Stark at NREL, who argues that smaller closed loop systems can be built in larger number of sites and be more, more prevalent. Is that something that, that you looked at? Yeah, we didn't look at the specific technology, but I totally agree with you. You know, at the end, you know, every technology or every option that is going to address some of the issue of the existing technology, for example, you cannot build large pump hydro energy storage facilities everywhere, but you can deploy perhaps small facilities that are going to help, right? And then you're going to deploy different facilities in different locations. So I, I agree with you. That is a, a very interesting option. We didn't include any specific technology, but my, 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 message here is that we're going to need a variety of technologies and those technologies in some cases are going to be cost effective in other cases may not be cost effective but in general right like we're going to see a portfolio of energy storage technology if we want to achieve higher penetrations of wind and solar and of course you know a small pump hydro energy storage in my opinion uh, could be part of the solution or maybe depending on the specific location or situation in which we are going to evaluate this specific technology great um, when the models are developed for optimizing future resources, how is the embedded carbon included for each resource option, or is it? In, in this case, we didn't include any, you know, life cycle carbon emission. We only include combustion emissions. This is, again, you know, a limitation of, of this study. I agree we should look at the life cycle of the whole you know supply chain but again you know we're gonna have more uncertainty right like <laughs> do we know the, the the carbon emission of each uh, stage of the supply chain for you know lithium ion batteries for hydrogen or for solar pv or for wind uh, my guess is that is it's gonna be full of uncertainties <laughs> that, that's a big life cycle analysis <laughs> yeah <laughs> i agree <laughs> but it's, it's interesting and i think you we should be you know uh, uh, do some work on that area be more like you know holistic approaches to problems okay on to the next um this is from ron former uh founder of cress and former siri uh scientist um, i believe it's very important to couple future energy storage options with carbon negativity more than just neutrality um is there any better option than biochar to accomplish those goals is that something that was in, in included in these studies or not i guess yeah we did include like negative technologies but let me mention something here here we focus mostly on the power system right like we didn't include cross-sectoral applications and for me that is the next step right like yes yeah, we know kind of know how to integrate wind and solar into the power system right like okay you know curtailment storage technologies okay dokie but what about let's say transportation what about uh uh, high temperature processes what about you know chemical facilities how do we integrate wind and solar pv power sources into those energy systems that you know that up to today we haven't integrated any wind and solar in those sectors right so this is the place in which you know cross-sectoral technologies for example hydrogen green ammonia or you know uh, power to x uh, uh, technologies are going to be key because they are going to facilitate the integration of power 
I mean, solar and, and wind power beyond the power system. So I think the next step is to include all of those additional technologies that are going to facilitate the integration or the reduction of carbon emissions in all of those sectors in which we haven't, you know, addressed today. We don't have a solution to reduce carbon emissions, let's say, for high temperature processes. Hydrogen could be an option, right? But I think that could be something very interesting to, to do. Get, you know, curtailment, produce hydrogen, and then use that hydrogen for high temperature processes to reduce carbon emissions. That could be interesting to to analyze. Great. Um, here's the next one. Um, industrial geothermal is starting to co-locate with oil and gas to benefit from depleted fossil fuel reservoirs. Do you have a sense of whether this technology will have a significant impact on the storage scenario in this decade? Any flexible renewable power generation technology is going to reduce the needs for energy storage. And, you know, the, the question is, it's going to be more cost effective than energy storage. I think that is going to depend on the specific case that we're going to evaluate. We cannot say that uh, I have been working on storage, but I cannot say that storage is the solution, right? Or the, the unique solution. I'm going to, I think there, there is going to be a combination of different technologies, storage technologies, geothermal power, you know, a small hydropower facility, for example, a small uh, pump hydro uh, power facility or storage facilities. And then the combination of each of those variety of technologies or the optimal combination of those technologies is going to depend depends on the specific case. In CAISO, you know, solar PV is very, you know, cost effective, but then you have other places in which maybe hydropower or, or geothermal power sources are going to be more cost effective than solar PV, for example. So I think there is not going to be a unique solution for all power system in the planet. I think there are going to be a specific, you know, pool of technologies that are going to be cost effective for this specific case. And then when you move to another system with a different shape of the electricity demand or different, you know, uh, geological constraints, for example, then you're going to have a different uh, set of technologies that are going to be cost effective for that specific uh, case. But I, I think, you know, everybody's going to be playing a role. Wonderful. Um, next question here. Um, which loads are you addressing? Um, only the present conventional electric loads or the projected loads when you include beneficial electrification like EVs and heat pumps? Yeah, we, we um, use projected uh, electricity load from the Energy Information Administration model. So I guess they may include some electrification, but not aggressive electrification. And that could be also interesting, right, to, to, to analyze cases in which you electrify different sectors. Of course, you're going to have, you know, greater electricity demand, but also different shape. And that could be really interesting to see, you know, how different shapes in the electricity demand are going to affect the storage requirements for the integration of wind and solar PV. Um, that could be indeed a very interesting study to, to do. Of course, you know, again, you know, full of uncertainty, right? Like, are you going to be charging the, 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 the electric vehicles in those two or three hours across the day uh, in different locations? So there, there, are, there are going to be a lot of uncertainties around those parameters, I would say. Okay. Um, has NREL seen economic advantage with thermal compared to electrical for seasonal energy storage? That is a very interesting question. And, um, there was a study in which I was not involved, uh, and they evaluated thermal energy storage. And I agree, in some specific cases, en thermal energy storage could be really cost effective. Um, and also, you know, imagine a case in which you have a uh, heat demand, and then you can use the thermal energy storage technology to provide not only, you know, seasonal or long duration energy storage, but also to provide an additional service to the to the energy system. That that could be, you know, very interesting and. I think flexibility is key. If you have a technology that can provide long duration seasonal energy storage, but also a additional service to the energy system, then the economy is gonna be much better than just providing just one single service, right? Because you can stack different uh, revenues in your system. So um, I think thermal energy storage is, could be cost effective depending on the specific uh, location or technology. And again, you know, if you have more flexibility, if you are able to provide a additional service service to the energy system, that's going to help your economics. Okay. Um, are raw material supply considerations included in the model? 
For example, is there enough lithium available? In the model, if a supply limit or constraint is reached, uh, does the model then choose another option? I really love that question, and that was the reason why we didn't include any specific name for those technologies, because you know we cannot assume that you can deploy 20 gigawatts of lithium-ion batteries, let's say, uh, in five years, because you know you have critical materials that are involved in the supply chain for for this technology. So we did include those constraints. My perception is the following. Um, we have, let's say, um, we need, let's say, 50 gigawatts of energy storage for short duration energy storage, right? Uh, lithium ion batteries could be used, but if you have a constraint on the supply side of lithium ion batteries, that means that someone else is gonna be part of the solution, right? The technology may be more expensive, but if you have a constraint on the supply chain of lithium ion batteries, you can do almost nothing, right? So you need to integrate the next cheapest technology in the system. And from the technology point of view, I think that is amazing because right now, different technologies are trying to develop energy storage solutions. And, and this is cool because we are, in the future, I think we're gonna have different options. And that means that, you know, at the end, you know, the cheapest or the most efficient technologies are gonna be taking big, the big portion of the, of the market. So from the technology point of view, I think you know this diversity in technology developers, let's say you know thermal batteries, uh, flow batteries, um, gravity-based energy storage technologies. I think all of those guys or technologies are going to be playing a role, and you know whoever is able to develop the cheapest or more efficient technology, that guy is going to be taking the biggest part of the of the market, and then the other guys are going to take the remaining part of the market. But I think is it's good that we have different options. We are not going to rely just on lithium-ion battery, for example. There are different guys trying, or, techno or technology developers, trying to develop new technologies. And I think it's, it's amazing. Great. Um, so here's a little bit of a follow-on uh, to that earlier about the, you know, the, the future load with beneficial electrification. Um, how do you estimate net load in the case for storage will change when we do see a major shift to EVs and heat pumps for heating? Well, by definition, right, net load is just a, a metric that we typically use to characterize the, the load of the system. And this basically includes just, you know, at this, the, the original load minus the availability of wind and solar PV or variable uh, power sources. I think for electrification, the, the point is that this is not additional generation this is a additional load and it's difficult right to, to assume that everybody is going to be charging the vehicles at the given hour so in that case my approach would be use a transportation model to forecast your additional load and make sure that you include a uncertainty analysis on that calculation and do the analysis not only for the you know the projected more likely let's say uh, load shape, but also include uncertainties around uh, this um, additional load and analyze, you know, okay, this is going to be happen, this is going to be the situation if we assume that our forecast is right, but if not, this could be the implications of having a different shape in that electricity demand from, let's say, electric vehicles, for example. I think uncertainty analysis is going to be key there because I think there is no way you can predict the behavior of electric vehicle charging in five, 10, or 20, or, <laughs> or 30 years. Okay. Um, I did not see how the impact of demand response programs can impact storage needs. Uh, could you address this? Yeah, we did include demand response uh, options. Um, there is a, a study from another national lab. I don't recall now the, the, the title, but it, it's going to help, but it's not going to eliminate the need for energy storage. That is my, my feeling or my perception. Yes, it's going to help. Maybe, you know, it's going to reduce maybe a storage requirement by 5%, for example, or 2%, but it's not going to eliminate the need for energy storage. In, in summary, every option that we have, right, to address this wind and solar PV problem is going to help. But I think at the end, it's going to be a combination of different options, energy storage, curtailment, geothermal, small hydropower, small pump hydro energy storage, demand side uh, 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 options, for example. And I think, you know, the, the, the portion of the pie that everybody's gonna get depends on how cost-effective a given option is gonna be. And that is gonna depend on the specific case. So I think everybody's gonna have a part of the pie. Um, 
um, how big it's gonna depends on how efficient you are and the specific you know case let's say kaiso versus ERCOD or versus miso or us versus china or india or costa rica they have a lot of hydropower right so okay i think was that pnnl possibly that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. PNNL, yeah. Is, is it the transactional uh, i think they did it as a transactional study that somebody sent me i haven't looked at it yet yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll get, maybe we'll get them to talk um <laughs> So uh, great. Uh, next question here. Um, NREL colleague here on the buildings team. Um, do any of the future load estimates uh, in your group account for increases in building energy efficiency, um, as well as you know, sort of building scale demand side measures? Yeah. Uh, to to be honest, I I don't have a answer to that question. I need to double check the assumptions associated with the model that the Energy Information Administration is using to project that electricity demand. But my feeling is that no, I think those uh, projections are more based on population growth, for example, and maybe some efficiency improvement, but not, you know, a lot of details regarding, you know, potential improvement in the um, building sector, I would say, because this is more, you know, macro energy model. So I think they are not going to include details about, you know, how uh, um, efficiency is going to improve for the building sector, for example. Okay, so so quick follow on. Uh, any idea when Reeds or Plexos are going to allow building technology efficiency uh, and virtual power plant plants to compete directly in the electricity markets? That is a very. I, I really love that question. And um, let let me say something. Uh, today we are working on a project in which we are trying to integrate the modeling of long duration seasonal energy stores into Reeds and Plexus because Plexus. Plexus and REITs cannot do the optimization of long duration and seasonal energy storage devices. So I think, you know, we are getting there, but we have a lot of problems to solve before we are able to include all of those additional uh, uh, options. But I agree that we should be looking, and indeed we are looking into that direction. We should be aware that we don't have only storage solutions. We have demand side solutions. We have uh, electrification solutions. And I think, you know, more holistic approaches are needed because our energy system is more complex. Different, you know, supply elements, different demand elements and interaction between those elements. And from the modeling point of view, if we want results that are more robust or more accurate, I would say, uh, we need to be aware of all of those options. We need to uh, be able to model those options in detail, right? Like Today, REITs or Plexus cannot do the modeling of long duration and seasonal energy storage technologies, even though we know that this technology may play a role in higher wind and solar uh, uh, power, uh, uh, and solar PV power energy systems. Okay. Um, last question at the moment here, and this is a question I've been waiting for. Um, any insights regarding the trade-off between building more transmission to tie individual RTOs and markets together versus trying to optimize individual RTOs? Should we be building more transmission to, or, or how do we model the, the trade-off? Yeah, I think it's a tricky question and very interesting question. Thank you very much for the, the question. Um, my, as energy storage technologies can reduce the need for transmission expansion. Uh, you know, I am not, even though I have been working on the energy storage uh, area, I, I will not say that energy storage technology is what we need to, to, to reduce, you know, uh, uh, transmission expansion. I think in some cases, you may need just to build some additional transmission capacity and avoid the installation of, of a very expensive energy storage facility to capture BRE surplus across different critical or just few critical hours across the year, something like that, right? Uh, because that is going to provide more flexibility. So my feeling is, yes, energy storage can reduce transmission or the needs for transmission capacity expansion, but I think transmission expansion is going to be part of the solution. I am not see uh, a, a system in which, you know, you just build energy storage and okie dokie. Uh, something that could be also interesting to see is that imagine you have a system in which you have significant solar PV deployment and you have another system in which you have significant, let's say, uh, wind deployment and you can interconnect those systems to shift 
uh, via issue plus across different regions. Regions, sorry. So in that case, I can see a transmission uh, uh, expansion playing a role or being part of the solution. It's going to be more cost effective than, than building a storage in each of those systems to capture the VRA surplus or to do the seasonal shifting of VRA surplus. I don't know, but my feeling is that that's, the solution to that problem is going to depend depends on the specific case. So in some cases, um, transmission expansion could be part of the solution. So I don't see energy storage just, you know, uh, being more cost effective than transmission expansion everywhere or for every case. I think there are going to be cases in which additional transmission transmission capacity is going to help. Okay. Um, one more question here. Um, Mark Jacobson's studies purporting to show a path to 100% renewable energies, 100% uh, renewables gets a lot of press, um, but it does get some criticism uh, from those who say the model is too primitive and overstates the results. Can you can't contrast Jacobson's research and the models, uh, you know, relative to the models you are talking about today? I know it's a little bit of a third rail. Maybe. Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting question. And, um, I am not surprised to see that question or to listen to that question. But usually I, I, I try not to talk about other studies, but I'm going to talk about mine or ours, right? So one quick or, or key limitation of this study is that we focus mostly on the Invest, investment part of the problem. We didn't include, you know, reliability constraints, ramping capabilities or requirements for the system, uh, frequency stability for that system. Is that system going to be stable? You know, from the voltage and frequency uh, point of view, we don't know. And I think, yes, this study is kind of interesting, but I will not say that our results show that we need just energy storage for the, if we want to achieve 100% renewable. I think we're going to need additional technologies that can provide, you know, frequency and voltage support. Of course, you know, hydrogen technologies, pump hydro energy storage facilities can provide those services, but we don't have the, the tools today to do the, the comprehensive analysis and to show, hey, you know, 100% renewable power system with just energy storage is going to be uh, feasible. It's going to depend on the, do you have, you know, enough um, availability for the deployment of big energy, uh, hydrogen energy storage facilities with flexibility from the you know frequency and voltage support point of view? Uh, maybe not. And then you need additional technologies to provide those services. So my, my feeling is that all of those studies, you know, they have a lot of, um, how do you say, um, assumptions that or simplifications that impact the results. So I cannot say that we demonstrate that with energy storage, you can achieve 100% renewable power systems. My feeling is we show that energy storage could help us, but we need you know, more complex and robust models to do a more realistic analysis of the needs and opportunities for energy storage in order to achieve higher penetrations of wind and solar PV. We need to check not only the economics, we need to check the operational details of the system the frequency and, and voltage, and, you know, stability of the system. What happened if, you know, we have an event like what happened in Texas a few, you know, I think last or one year ago, something like that. Is the system going to be reliable under those conditions that we didn't include in the model? Uh, I don't have the answer to that question. And today, I don't have the model to answer that question, right? So I think, you know, we are getting there, but we are far away from having a model that allow us to say, hey, I have a system that, or a model that demonstrate that we can achieve 100% renewable power system just with energy storage technologies. So that is my, my perception. Of course, I, I don't want to comment on other studies, but I can say that our study has a lot of limitations. And we show that just that energy storage could help, but we need additional analysis to, to be more uh, safe regarding, you know, this is going to be a robust design for the power system that is going to be able to address those additional uh, conditions that we didn't include in our analysis. Okay, great. Well, it looks like that is uh, our last question. So uh, and we're finishing nice and early here. So um, Omar, I want to thank you again for, for taking the time. I appreciate it. And um, for all those who attended, thank you very much. Um, I will go ahead and uh, since we don't have any more questions, I'll go ahead and sign off.
Uh, hope you all have a great evening. And Omar, thanks again. Thank you very much, guys, for the time and for the very interesting questions. You're welcome. All right. Good night, everyone. Bye.